All right. We are continuing our series through the pastoral epistles in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And the whole thrust of this chapter has to do with the way that the people of God should act in, or I should say as, not so much in, but as the church of God. And so, uh, I had this thought. Uh, how many of you, if you were getting ready for uh, a big job interview, would dress up in your lousiest clothes? Probably not. The job you want, you're definitely going to not wear your lousy clothes. Okay, if you're an athlete, when you go onto the field, there's a different uniform and a different set of rules appropriate than when you're in the classroom, right? In fact, your coach would be rather ticked if you showed up even to practice in regular school clothes and did not have, you know, the equipment that you needed for practice. If you weren't ready in the appropriate situation for the appropriate actions. And what Paul writes to Timothy here in chapter 2 has everything to do with how the church should function. Meaning, are they dressed appropriately in the spirit and are they acting appropriate as the church? Right? If you were to go onto a basketball court, there are certain rules that apply that do not apply off the court. There's a uniform that is required. And so similarly, if we are to be part of the church, there is an expectation placed upon us by God for how we are to look and how we are to act. And throughout chapter 2, those expectations are laid out in four primary ways. See if this clicker is working this week. It is working. Wonderful. Okay, the four primary ways that it is laid out for us is that prayer is prominent in our churches, that the church is filled with a missional message, that Christ is kept central, and that the distractions are discarded. And I will go ahead and let you all know if you've ever read 1 Timothy chapter 2 before tonight. There's a, a bit at the end which has caused quite the kerfuffle within the Christian community as to the role of women. And by and large, we are not going to address that issue tonight. Instead, that will be a part of our discussion when we look at chapter 3. Because chapter 3 of 1 Timothy deals with elders and deacons and in fact chapter 3 ends with this saying I hope to come to you soon but I am writing things, these things to you so that if I delay you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God which is the church of the living God a pillar and buttress of the truth so he's saying look everything that I've just informed you in chapters 1, 2, and 3 is all about how the people of God should act as the church of God. Are you behaving appropriately? And so, what he deals with in chapter 3 has to do with some of the roles that men and women take. In particular, that of elders and deacons. So, as far as the role of women, in some of those controversial passages at the end of 1 Timothy 2, we'll deal with those next week. Because it seems appropriate next week. This week, we're going to deal with the larger thrust of why he addresses women, as well as men, at the end of chapter 2, and how it pertains to proper worship. Okay? Meaning, there is a way that we should act at church. Okay? Most of you are unfamiliar with this, either because you didn't grow up in church, or because you grew up in River Bluff. River Bluff is like the most chill church I've ever known, okay? But I have served in a church that was old school. I grew up in a church 
as it transitioned from old school to a more contemporary feel. Let me tell you, there were some people in that church who definitely had opinions about how you're supposed to act. Okay? And they would tell you their opinions. They were not shy in sharing their thoughts. And so, church began to get a stigma, at least here in American culture, of being sort of stuffy and, and judgmental because people, in their reverence for God, would go sometimes too far or out of bounds in addressing issues outside of Scripture and seeking to conform strict rules and guidelines that were past what Scripture mandated for how the church should act. That is not what we're going to talk about tonight. Instead, we're just going to quickly go over what Paul says about how the people of God should look and act as a part of worship. And the first one is that the people of God should be active in prayer. Prayer should be a, an essential part of church. And it shouldn't just be this thing that we do before meals or a test we forgot to study for or a game. It should be essential to our lives. But too often, prayer becomes a thing that is overlooked. There might be reasons for that. But Paul lists in verse 1 of chapter 2 four types of prayers. All four of these are prayers generally, but he gives four types of prayers that should be made, he says, for all people. And the first one is supplications. And so this is when we're, we're asking the Lord for things. And, and this is asking the Lord to maybe deliver us from hardship or to give us strength for a task ahead. We are looking to the Lord, our sustainer and our provider, to provide for our needs. And so we come to him with supplications, asking him to help us. The next is prayer, but in a more general sense of all of the usual communication that goes on in our relationship with God. Because it should be a relationship. And when we talk to the Lord, it should not always be one-sided. How many of you are really good friends with the person who the only time they talk to you is when they need something from you? Are they like your best friend? No. No. Your best friends are the ones that have intimate details about your life and that you communicate with frequently. And so should it be with the Lord that we develop an intimate relationship with him, not just by coming to him and asking for things all the time, but by communicating with him throughout our day and spending time in silence to listen and receive from him as well. And church is a great time for us to sit and to receive from the Lord. Next, he mentions intercessions, which are supplications with the special uh, sort of application of for certain people. You intercede for other people. An example of this would be if you are praying for someone because you are know they you know they're going through a hardship, or they they have a big test coming up, so you're you're going to pray for them. You know, they're struggling with something. So you're praying specifically for that person. And the last one is Thanksgiving. We should spend time in our prayers thanking the Lord, not only for what he has already answered, for how he has blessed us, but also just for who he is. He is God. He is magnificent. That's why all of our worship songs tonight revolved around sort of the character of God and giving him glory because our prayers should involve giving him reverence and showing appreciation for him. Okay? So, first, part of proper worship is that it should be spent in prayer. Prayer not only molds us and our hearts to fit with the Lord's will for our life. But it also
also, as John Piper has famously said, prayer changes things. We can't always explain it, but God is sovereign over all things, and he is in control of all of the details of our life, and we trust that prayer changes things. Next, as the church, we should be filled with a heart for missions. We should be willing to proclaim the gospel message, and so we're going to read this next section of verses, in fact, we'll read it twice because it also refers to the centrality of Christ in our message. But when we look at having a missional mindset, we're talking about both a mindset that is outward focused on others, but also inward. Do we have a mindset that is focused on representing Christ and advancing his causes within the church as well as without not without, but outside the church. So, let's pick up in verse 2, and let's read verse 2 through verse 2, and onward. It says, for kings, let's just start at the beginning. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We'll stop there. Notice the, the, both from outside of the church and within the church, the list of things mentioned. As we pray, we should be praying for all People. In the Greek, what is meant here is all kinds of people. And there's a tendency in our sinful flesh to only pray for those people like us. To only bring to mind or to bring to the Lord those people similar to us. But here, the challenge is to pray for all kinds of people. Meaning the people that we like and dislike, the people we get along with and the, we don't get along with, the people that we agree and disagree with. Republicans are praying for Democrats. <gasps> yes. Are we praying for all kinds of people? Are we praying for everyone? Because everyone is in need of the gospel. And we should especially be praying, it says in verse 2, for kings and all who are in high positions. Why? Because scripture is clear in other passages that it is Christ, the king of kings, who establishes those authorities. There is no authority apart from him, and all authority that we wield on earth is delegated authority. And so we need to pray for the authority figures, pray that, that God would use them and lead them for the protection and flourishing of the people under their care. And this is a particularly, oh, no, no, Bryn, don't touch electrical things. This is particularly important for Paul because Paul was imprisoned likely around the time of Nero, if not in the time of Nero, and he was the most deadly persecutor of Christians. Yet he says, pray for kings and all who are in positions of authority. And so, as we have a mindset of gospel advancement, we are praying for everyone outside of the church. But also, part of having a missional mindset is that within the church, we are living and growing in a way that represents God well. We pray for kings so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That's on us. It is our charge to lead a godly and dignified life. We may have a good leader who allows the flourishing of Christianity, but if we do not walk in Christ, it is in vain. And as the church, if we are not walking in Christ, our message falls on deaf ears. So not only should we seek to live a godly life, 
but we should desire that they come to a knowledge of the truth, and this requires teaching. Inside the church, we should be seeking to build up one another in the truth, growing in our knowledge of truth, growing in our faith, so that we are then equipped to go into the world and represent Christ to the world and bring the gospel to them. Our gospel message cannot just be a message of glad tidings or, hey, add God to what you have going on. It'll be good for you. But our message should be centered around Christ and his work to redeem us. It is not what you are doing plus God. It is abandon everything for God. That is the gospel. It is that we must surrender all, no matter how valuable we may deem it, to gain that which is most valuable, which is the Lord. And so let's continue. In verse 5 it says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And so... While we know it is true that not all people will come to a knowledge of the truth, we should still have a heart that all people and all kinds of people would come to a knowledge of the truth. We need to understand as part of our gospel message that there is one God. Meaning there is one way. Now for the Greco-Roman world, polytheism was, was a hit. It was the most popular thing out there. The monotheistic view of Christians was, was unheard of. But America today isn't that different. We don't believe in polytheism, but we do believe in pluralism. Hey, it doesn't matter what path you take as long as you're on the path, man. All roads lead to God. All dogs go to heaven. But this is not true. There is one way. We must believe in the one God as he is revealed in scripture and the one mediator who is Jesus Christ, who through his life, death, and resurrection secured our ransom. It was through his work that we are redeemed before God. It is because of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross to remove sin and his resurrection, which defeats death, that we are able to be in restored fellowship with God. And not only does Jesus act in this one time to fix our relationship with God, but it says that he acts as a mediator for us. In other scriptures, it talks about him interceding on our behalf. That means that he is continually there beseeching the Lord in our favor. We have an advocate before God on our behalf and it is Christ Jesus and all of this is, is amazing and, and true and wonderful and, and dynamic in that if we truly believe the scriptures and the things that they tell us then it should change our life it should change the way that we live and interact with others should change our heart and our desires so that when we come to church it's not about hanging out it's not about friends it's not about fun it's not about if Casey or Scott did a good job if it was entertaining or not it should be about focusing on hearing a word from the Lord but what the church in Ephesus was encountering and what we are prone to encounter in our world today are distractions which will pull us away from where our hearts and minds should be focused when we gather for worship. When we as the church gather as a body of believers, 
there is a standard of right conduct. Now, it might not be the same as Grandma Betty's or Ethel's and that we need to wear a tie, we need to sit up straight, and we have to do certain things that are outside of Scripture. But Scripture does make plain that the instructions given here at the end of 1 Timothy 2 don't just simply apply to the cultural context of Ephesus, but to all Christians. Look at verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray. In every place. Not just in Ephesus, because Ephesus has issues. But in every place. The instruction that Paul is about to give both for men and for women is something that is there by God's grace for even us today that we should learn how to act in church. So that we are not acting a fool, but we are in the right place place to receive from the Lord the blessing that he has in store for us. And so he continues. I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Now these two things, holy hands and anger and quarreling, were two of the predominant issues facing the men of the church of Ephesus, and their predominant issues that are facing us here today in the 21st century. Because if we are not living a life that is, as much as we are able, free from sin, our prayer life, our ability to receive from the Lord is hindered. If we are stuck in habitual sin in our life, then we are not lifting up holy hands. But we are distracted and our hearts are not with us. We're not able to receive from the Lord. Similarly, there were quarrels and infighting and anger and disputes. Some of that may have been people well-intentioned arguing against some of the false teachers. But some of it just may have been that Dave and Bill didn't get along. They were sitting in the same pew that Sunday. What Paul writes here about men not being angered and quarreling should remind us of what Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, if one of you desires to bring your offering to the Lord and there at the altar, remember that you have something against someone else, leave your offering, go and repair that relationship, then come and make your offering. But too often... We think that we can come into church with our sin habits and all of our unresolved, broken relationships and sit there like everything is fine and we will receive the full blessing of the Lord. But we cannot. We must set ourselves and our relationship to others right before the Lord if we desire to walk in obedience to the Lord as part of his church. Likewise, there is instruction given to the women. Verse 9. Likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, some of this we'll get into next week as we talk about roles for men and women within the church. But what I want to draw your attention to, ladies, is the broad brushstrokes that are being painted here for how women in the church should behave. Meaning that when the women come to church, they should be dressed ready for worship. Ready for everyone's attention to be on the Lord, not on them. 
And this is not just an issue for guys, but this is an issue for you ladies as well. Because you're more prone to judge one another just as much, if not more, than a man is prone to judge you. Additionally, the command against costly attire is this way for those who had wealth to distinguish themselves or set themselves above those who had less. But the church should not be filled with divisions, but should be full of unity. And so the command is for modesty, both for appropriateness, but also for unity. That instead of the attention being brought to them, the attention is appropriately focused on the Lord. And secondly, that the women should be able to learn, and that requires a humility to be able to receive that instruction. Now, within the Jewish customs, women were not allowed into the inner parts of the temple, but were kept on the outside. But what we notice in Jesus' ministry is that women are invited in to receive instruction, to learn, and to be discipled. And here, Paul's command, which isn't exactly clear in the English, but is in the Greek, is essentially, hey, let the ladies learn. It's an encouragement that they deserve to be discipled just as much as the men. But then he adds this encouragement that they need to come in with a quiet and humble attitude, ready to receive the instruction, not creating controversy or further distractions. So then the question that comes to us tonight is twofold. Are we willing to humble ourselves and submit to what Christ has done on the cross for our, our salvation. To lay aside our will for our life and accept what he has done. And to make him central instead of ourselves. And for those of you who are already believers, then the question becomes, do you have the humility and the wisdom to set aside any prejudice or ideas of the way it ought to be to receive humbly God's instruction. And will you let it change the way that you live your life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you right now. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me where I get stuck in my ways and where I am prone to not change to receive instruction from you or where I have quarrels in my life but God I pray for these students Lord I pray that they would have a humility to lay aside every distraction and every hindrance and instead just come in humility and submission to you and to receive instruction from you and to let their lives be molded by you for you are good your design for our life is good. Help us as the church to represent you well. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 All right. Smoker bleeders. I have questions.